very, very. <laughs> and so, though Jim is retiring, going out to pasture, he calls it, we present this gift as a token of our continuing friendship and esteem. Well, fellas, I really can't tell you how much this means to me. But I can tell you that this truly wonderful gift will be a constant reminder of your friendship and the help you've given me. And through the years, I shall always remember the pride I feel this evening in having won your companionship and good opinion. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Just wait till the gang sees this. Hey, kids, come on the running. Oh, it's just perfectly perfect. And so are you, both of you, Mom and Dad. Well, Sally, you're our big girl now. Mother and I wanted our present to tell you just how proud we are of you. for something like that. <laughs> oh, gee. Last but not least. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Gee, thanks, Dad. It sure is a beauty, and the best, too. Maybe I can get places now on time, <laughs> and that'll be something. Yep, that'll be something all right, if you do. Huh? I guess I was like that, too, when I was your age. You know, my father was a stickler for being on time. He preached and preached on the value of time, the importance of it, how much it meant to others, as well as yourself. Uh, like a lot of young fellows, it sort of went in one ear and out the other. Then. But as I grew older, I learned how right your grandfather was. He always felt that uh, promptness and consideration for the time of others was a mark of character and integrity. Uh, this fine watch, my 21st birthday present, has always reminded me of that. And it is one of my most precious possessions, as I hope yours will be to you. Yes, for hundreds of years, a fine watch has been one of man's most highly prized possessions. Its possession always has been a mark of distinction, its performance and beauty a source of pride. When the first watches were made, they were so ornate and expensive that only monarchs and the wealthy could own them. Despite the fact that they often varied as much as an hour a day, they were the mark of distinction, the badge of wealth. Today, that mark of distinction still remains, but modern American production methods have made it possible for people everywhere to own a fine watch. Less ornate, perhaps, for times have changed, but certainly more accurate. But which watch? That is the question. There are many conflicting claims, many aspirants to the throne of leadership in the watchmaking industry. What makes a fine watch fine? There are many things. First, the name and reputation of the company. And that is important, because a good name and respect can only be gained by quality of product. A quality of product built up by years and years of fine watchmaking experience. But before you can even begin to make a really fine watch, it takes people, many people of long experience, people with ideals and ambition and pride in their craftsmanship, together with vast facilities built up through years of patient development. 
many buildings, special tools, and much equipment, many laboratories for never-ending research to maintain the spirit of pioneering, of leadership in research. It takes a record of performance, too, through time itself, time the test of any product, during which a product survives, grows, and becomes a byword for satisfactory performance through long years of service. And it takes the preference of people who buy and sell quality products, fine watches which are fine all the way through. So let's go into a fine watch factory and see what it takes to make a fine watch and why everyone can't do it. We'll begin with people, people chosen carefully on the basis of rigid tests, job selection and classification for exactly the right skills and temperament. People who, before they learn the trade, must first show that they can learn the knacks, the nimble finger dexterity to make them successful in their jobs. It takes almost a year to make a really fine watch, but it takes years to make a watchmaker, even under friendly supervision and the help of more experienced fellow workers. Because of these high standards, watchmaking is a career into which sons follow their fathers, adding their youthful spirit to the accumulated experiences of the years. And here, a career is more than just a job. Nearly half of the employees in this fine watch factory have been with the company for five, 10, 15, 20, or more years. And some certain few of these, with the company more than 50 years, go back in memory and experience to the first Hamilton watch ever sold. This watch, built more than 54 years ago, can still pass rigid time inspection tests for railroad service. Such accuracy and dependability are products of the incredible skills found in this magic land of Lilliput, where little things make a vitally big difference. Yes, to make a fine watch fine takes fine people and it takes the most modern facilities for designing and making the tools and equipment to manufacture fine watches as well. Here are machines making machines, delicate machines making still more delicate and precise machines, which are in turn used to make almost unbelievably small parts. Unbelievably small parts? Have you ever had a speck of dust in your eye? Some of the actual watch parts are no larger than a speck of dust. This speck is a watch screw actual size. And alongside is a model of the screw, enlarged 100 diameters. And there's enough metal in the enlarged model to make one million actual screws of this type. Modern facilities, miracles in miniature. On this machine, watch screws are made complete with exquisite precision. Yet, they are almost invisible to the naked eye. Here in this small pillbox are 300,000 tiny screws, a full year's output of one of these amazing machines. So in a world of fascinating smallness, highly skilled people work with fine machines to a super fine degree of accuracy in every step in manufacturing, like making extremely small axles called balance staffs with tolerances from the absolute point of accuracy to only one ten thousandth of an inch. In all operations, such as the manufacture of a balance wheel, that tiny, constantly moving wheel, accuracy is almost a religion. And through the skill, the patience of the watchmaker's craft, bits of metal are transformed into minute watch parts of technical perfection. These craftsmen have drilled holes so small through pieces of metal that they cannot be seen by the naked eye until light is placed behind them. And just to keep in practice, a technician recently drilled a hole in a hair, his way of demonstrating the type of minute operation without which the manufacture of really accurate small timepieces would be impossible. People, machines, and metals. There's accuracy in metals, too. Take, for example, the hairspring of America's fine watch. Here is the beating heart, pulsing five times each second, controlling the operation of the balance wheel and determining the accuracy of the watch. Although it is called a hairspring, it is sometimes only one-fifth as thick as a human hair, 
and because of its small size and the job it has to do, it must be as nearly perfect as human skill can make it. In this steel mill, materials are weighed to split fractions of an ounce on scales that can weigh an eyelash, can weigh a fingerprint. In the making of metal for this hairspring, it takes careful control of the ingredients and careful control of the heat and a lot of patience and know-how. The exclusive alloy known as Allen Bar Extra is produced by this miniature steel mill in 10 pound ingots, only two pounds of which are actually used. Without Allen Bar Extra, the amazing and record-shattering performance of Hamilton marine chronometers and other wartime pieces would never have been achieved. It is now used in all watches made by this company. When you are making the finest hair springs in the world, you watch that raw material like an incubator baby. A half ton a year total output and only 25 pounds of that usable. Steel alloy, much more precious than gold, ounce for ounce when it's made into hair springs. A pound of Ellen Barr extra hair springs would be worth nearly a million dollars. Although it does its part to make a fine watch fine, Finished alloy is only a raw material. Before it can be used, it must be fabricated, shaped to its purpose. So the ingot is forged into a rod. The rod is turned and swedged, beaten and stretched, and then processed and extended to 60,000 times its original length. From a 20-inch rod, 20 miles of mirror-finished ribbon, finer than a hair, produced from start to finish, under exacting laboratory conditions for quality control. But there's still more to it than that. The flattened ribbon of wire is precisely coiled, permanently set by heat into its final spiral shape, and then through incredibly delicate operations installed on the balance assembly. Did we say that the hairspring is the heart of time? Did we say that the accuracy of a really fine watch is determined to a large degree by the accuracy of its tiny hairspring and balance wheel? Only in this factory will you see this machine, an amazing electronic vibrator, a machine that measures with microscopic precision the exact length of hairspring needed to make the completed watch a really accurate fine watch. By testing no more than the hairspring and balance wheel, with no other gears, springs, nor any of the other vital watch parts, this machine can yet tell with almost absolute precision how fast or slow a watch will run before it is assembled. In 1769, when James Watt patented his first steam engine, he was proud of his manufacturing accuracy, as demonstrated by the fact that certain parts of the engine were machined to tolerances of one-tenth of an inch. Today, parts that go into a really fine watch are made to tolerances as small as one ten-thousandth of an inch, some even to one one-hundred-thousandth of an inch, and instruments are used that can measure one millionth of an inch. To make fine American watches, Special precision measuring instruments, gauges, and tests had to be developed. Measurement and re-measurement, inspection and re-inspection, check and double check. Fine watchmaking is the ritual of accuracy and the worship of precision. Of the 2,000 operations which go into the making of a fine watch, nearly half are inspections, and 20% of these are double inspections, or inspectors inspecting inspectors. A speck of dust and 40 pounds of bread dough. What has this to do with watchmaking? A great deal, it seems, when you realize that every morning this amount of bread dough is mixed and used throughout the factory to remove specks of dust, chips, and filings from small parts which have just been machined. Bread? Then how about honey to go with it? Ordinary honey is used to hold tiny jewels together during the manufacturing operation. Jewels, those tiny bits of extremely hard and precious stone, rubies and sapphires synthetically produced, which serve as bearings for moving parts. These bearings are so frictionless, movement so effortless, that a fine watch could be kept running for 4,000 years on the power used in lighting a 25-watt light bulb for one hour. To reduce friction in the vital parts, all fine watches have 17 or more jewels. This is the minimum number. More jewels can be used in watches, but it is important to understand 
that 17 or more jewels do not necessarily make a watch fine. That the measure of a good watch lies not alone in the number of jewels it may have, but in the attention that is given to every detail in the design, planning, manufacture, finishing, and assembly of every part that goes into a watch. Friction is the bugaboo of all machinery. In a fine watch, it is avoided like the plague. Oil is a friction fighter, so the watch oil to fight friction and prevent wear must be the finest of the fine. Here in miniature scale is a complete oil refinery producing what is probably the world's finest watch oil. A single flask like this is enough to lubricate half a million watches and yet most of this precious lubricant which costs about six thousand dollars a gallon is thrown away because it is delivered drop by drop to the watch assemblers. Then it is kept clean and fresh by a delivery schedule in which every two hours the leftovers are carefully wiped away and replaced. It takes nearly nine months to complete the 2,000 operations that go into the making of a really fine watch, but it takes nearly two years from the time a new watch movement is conceived to the delivery of the first production unit. During this time, more than 100,000 man-hours of design, careful engineering, and specialized skills go into the development of the new movement and the precision tools and equipment needed to build it. Here are watches that were never made. That is, after time and money went into their development, they were never put into production because they didn't measure up to the standards which make America's fine watch. To make a fine watch fine takes many laboratories. Laboratories for testing old and new materials. Laboratories for the control of quality. Laboratories where heat and extreme cold answer critical questions, where metals are twisted and torn apart. Laboratories where the answers to scientific problems are found on machines and measuring instruments that can see the invisible or can weigh a pencil mark. Laboratories where the highest development of nearly every science known to man plays a part in the production of a really fine watch. And research is an endless task. Almost since the beginning of time, man has been asking the question, what time is it? Here the question is, what time really is it? Imagine building a timepiece so accurate so faithful in its measurement of time that nowhere in the world was there a machine precise enough to check its error. This is what happened when the famous Hamilton Marine Chronometer was produced for our Navy during the war. To check this chronometer, built in mass production in defiance of watchmaking tradition, the electronic comparator was developed for the Naval Observatory to show variations measured in one two hundredths of a second. And the time microscope forerunner of all rapid timing devices used today is so precise that it reduces measurements which used to take days to less than half a minute. This magic lantern, the time projector, helps check the accuracy of tiny watches which have no second hands, enlarging the minute hand on a screen so that otherwise imperceptible movements can be accurately measured. Yes, it takes some of the world's most precise scientific measuring instruments to make sure that a fine watch is really fine. With the work of many hands, American production methods are making it possible for people in all walks of life to own fine watches. American craftsmanship with American men and women, with the wisdom of experience working alongside the eager spirit of American youth, with patience and skill and pioneering enthusiasm, all these produce the finest watches that human ingenuity can design. You can tell a man or woman by the watch he or she wears. People know that the possession of a fine watch is a mark of distinction. And fine jewelers everywhere know the story behind a fine watch, the inside story that makes the vital difference, for they hear the words of praise and of satisfaction, or the words of complaint and regret. Even more today than in days of old, a fine watch is a precious possession and a highly prized gift. Few other gifts are so appropriate, so long-lasting, so much a source of pride to both giver and recipient, and few possessions serve with such usefulness as that modern miracle in miniature, that lifelong friend and faithful servant, your watch. 
your fine watch. And that's what makes a fine watch really fine all the way through. Thank you.